I'm Richard Phillips. I'm a journalist with the World Socialist website. And today we're going to be speaking to Professor Lydia Morawska and Gary Alvernia. Um, Professor Morawska spoke with us some months ago, three or four months ago, about COVID and about her work. And so we felt it was a good time to catch up. Much has happened in those months. So how, what have you been, what have your feelings been over the last six months as we have watched the death toll climb in, in every country? Australia is now in the top uh, uh, per capita death toll in the world. And last week, the government declared that they are not going to mandate for mask wearing indoors. And it seems that very little is changing from the standpoint of the let it rip policy. Well, my feeling about the current situation is of deep frustration, because after all, we are in the third year of the pandemic. We've learned that the pandemic is not going to go away just because we are vaccinated. It's much more complicated. We've learned that people are not that keen wearing masks all the time. But the measure, which is so extremely important, which is improving indoor air quality in that sense of removing the virus from the, uh, from the air, which is ventilation and other measures, is basically not touched in most states of Australia. Some, some of the states are doing more in this, in particular Victoria is uh, much more advanced, but in states like in Queensland, there is basically nothing being done about this. Mm. One particular area of concern where these problems are very, very visible is the issue of schools. Uh, most schools in Australia are naturally ventilated, which means uh, uh, depending on opening windows. In the statement, for example, on the website of the uh, Queensland Education, uh, is that how good um, climate we have in Queensland, allowing windows to be open and natural ventilation. Well, the reality now is in the middle of winter, cold winter, that windows are in most schools closed all the time. I've got a lot of anecdotal evidence about this. We haven't conducted the study, but it's very clear that windows are closed because it's cold. If it's cold, um, the windows will be, will be closed. If anything, um, air conditioner will be on to warm up. So there's no ventilation. There's no ventilation and the confusion, which is, um, uh, brought by different recommendations, lack of recommendations uh, by different departments is such that basically keeps us close to uh, infection. We also see that in addition to COVID, there are lots of infections right now, flu, colds, and so on, because that's what normally happens during, uh, during the winter. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we are not doing absolutely anything about this, it's Frustrating, alarming, disappointing, all of this. I guess also on, on the subject of the rapidly increasing rates of infection, I think you've touched on this somewhat, but what do you think, particularly in light of the new variants, the impact of poor ventilation has on their spread and transmission? I mean, these are some of the most transmissible variants to date. Um, how, how does that play in with the rates of infection and poor ventilation? Well, so, so far, every next variant which appeared was more infectious than the previous variant. So uh, uh, ventilation is an extremely important measure, in particular for all variants, but in particular for more infectious new variants. So uh, this, is, this is an absolute necessity. Is there any government expenditure, well, with the with the elections and a new government, are there any particular expenditure expenditures that you would be demanding? And what's been their response? Is there any difference? The reality is that the federal government is not responsible for the situation in individual states in relation to control, uh, to controlling the pandemic on the ground. It is responsibility of the state. So I don't, I haven't seen anything in the federal government uh, 
about uh, doing anything in this. So it's it's the state's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the states, as I said, dependently which state different there's a difference in how this topic is approached. Uh, in some states like in Victoria, uh, there's much more work being done, but in others, there is just some words on the website, but there's no evidence of any work being done. And your, uh, you, you know, your fellow scientists, fellow workers, they they, they must be extre exceedingly alarmed about what is occurring. Well, all the uh, community of experts uh, from broad inter interdisciplinary fields, scientists like myself, engineers, uh, epidemiologists, medical professionals, architects, we are all extremely worried about the situation and we all try to act. But we've been trying to do this for the past, well, two years, basically writing to the previous federal government, writing to the state governments, and without basically, in some states, without, like Queensland, without yeah. any success at all. It, we are not giving up. We are still, we are working on this. And we are working on, with the hope that eventually there will be action, and that action will not be just temporary to address uh, same problems during the pandemic, but uh, leading to permanent change in terms of how the buildings are designed, how the buildings are operated to control indoor air in general and specifically the airborne infection. Mm. So we are, we are continuing working and fighting for this, but so far our um, uh, fight hasn't uh, really achieved much yet, and particularly not at the federal level. Well, and internationally, the, the struggle goes on. I mean, we had the example of Joe Biden declaring after getting COVID that it was perfect. He was perfectly fine. He could work. People should people should just carry on, keep working. And uh, within days of his or a day was it of him declaring that he was now COVID free, he was infected again. I mean, these are these are very bad images to be sending out to the population. Um, but as you say, your voices are not being heard. What would you like to do if you were able to alert the public? What would be the best means? What would be the best thing you would hope for? What we are saying very strongly now that we need, by we, I mean the society, uh, speaking from the um, position of Australia, we need indoor air quality standards and possible standards. Without having standards, which will protect us uh, against um, indoor air risks, including uh, infection transmission, voluntarily, nothing's going to happen. So that's what we are now driving towards providing the basis for indoor air quality standards and possible standards. And that's our target to convince the government governments to implement this. What, what sort of opposition are you running into in terms of implementing those sort of standards? What do they sort of give as the reasons for why they're not doing it, if they give any at all? Well, the, the, best, the worst problem is that uh, we are in many situations, most situations we encounter silence. For example, writing letters to the government, the government doesn't want to engage with us. A month or two months later, after receiving uh, the letter, we get some kind of a standard response that, well, the government is doing everything possible, everything is fine, there's no problem, and that's the end of the conversation. So we don't really have a chance to engage with the government. That's, that's one of the biggest problems. Because if the government wanted to listen, and even if they were arguments, if we were able to sit down together and discuss, perhaps we would be able to move this. But this silence and complete and ignoring, ignoring us, that's the most difficult. How to do it, how to progress. Well, one of the things that we've pointed to within this framework as well is the silence in general by the trade union. Either the teachers union, well, the teachers unions, and the health workers unions have really not taken up the issues that you and others have raised. And that's a, 
that's a major problem also. Have you had any contact with the unions or them with you? Well, uh, not in unions in very general sense, but for example, with the unions here at QUT, and they were very active and very interested in the topic. But, uh, and I helped them uh, kind of understand some of the issues, but how far they have been able to move this, well, with QUT, that's something I'm not sure. So what specific measures, apart from and obviously this is not a small thing, apart from ventilation, what other measures do you, would you propose should be carried out in order to deal with uh, the, the current variants and, and the rising death toll? Well, what, what I've been sort of going, of, depending from which angle we, we look at, as, I'm, as I'm, I'm stressing, we need standards. The standards will not be introduced in this time scale of the pandemic. But right now, we need, first of all, of inventory of the spaces in terms of ventilation. Uh, then, dependently of what can be done, what's found out about the ventilation, some spaces may not require uh, any additional actions because ventilation is already uh, acceptable. But in those spaces, when ventilation is not acceptable, then the question, what can be done in terms of retrofitting in terms of um, using air pur purifiers, in terms of using any other measures, and in particular, in monitoring. I'm stressing the importance of monitoring, and the monitoring we have all available is using uh, carbon dioxide. It, it is a proxy for ventilation, or, or proxy for good air quality, and like any proxies, it uh, has deficiencies. In particular, if you take um, a, a CO2 meter on, on the airplane uh, and measure concentrations uh, of the gas on the plane, you will find out that the concentrations are very high. On most uh, flights within Australia I've been, they are over or close to 2,000 ppm. Now, this is, this is a very high concentration, but it doesn't mean that in those environments, the risk of infection is uh, 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 relatively high compared uh, as the concentrations because air is uh, in uh, such environments recirculated. So mm -hmm. while concentration of carbon dioxide is high, which is not good for other reasons, um, uh, the filtration within the system of the recirculated air removes most of the virus. So, so it has to be understood in what situation CO2 is a measure of how good or how bad air quality is in terms of uh, infection transmission, but it is a very good measure. So uh, this is something which we uh, have available. So um, uh, inventories identify places which have poor ventilation and in those places taking adequate actions to improve the ventilation as much as possible without saying, just saying open the window. Because open the window when it's too cold, or too hot as will soon be, it's not going to be done because it is not being done. Uh, adding on to this point, I mean, we've also seen this year the sort of re-emergence of certain viruses, respiratory viruses that have sort of um, been quite suppressed in the two previous years, so influenza, um, RSV, um, and others that have now that have now started to make a comeback. I suppose the question is, the answer is fairly straightforward, but do, do poor ventilation standards, in your opinion, have an impact on the sort of resurgence of those viruses as well in the context of other restrictions being dropped? Well, of course, because these viruses are also transmitted through the air. These are respiratory viruses. So if there's poor ventilation, which is in many places now during the winter when it's cold, so um, that this has an impact on these viruses. In addition, um, it, during the winter, the conditions are in general um, favorable for survival, uh, not survival, not the good words of the viruses, but stability of these viruses. So improving ventilation will have a um, positive impact on everything, which means lowering the infection transmission. And uh, since those other infections are, uh, or other pathogens are not as infectious as uh, SARS-CoV-2, so it will have even a greater impact on, on, on them or reducing the risk. We were touching on earlier the idea of um, government sort of having taken the attitude that really not being a pandemic or, or you know, um, there's also been this idea of sort of 
recurring waves of COVID infection. You know, we're going to have a wave every few months, you know, maybe two months, two waves a year is what's been sort of um, sort of speculated on in the media and so on. What, I guess, speaking as a, as a, as a researcher, as one who's had a great deal of work and time invested in this idea of, of the COVID pandemic, what are the implications and the impacts on the population, in your opinion, from this idea of having recurrent waves? And as a second part to that question, do you think that attitude has influenced many of the, much of the public health response, or rather a lack of a public health response um, to the pandemic? The reoccurrence and the new waves this is a very uh, multi-angle problem because, first of all, this is a mutation, continuous mutation of the virus because we have the new variants. If there was no mutation at all, let's say, if the variants, if we were all still, still dealing with the initial variant, maybe with the, vac- with the vaccine, this could have been, the pandemic could have been well, stopped but because of this uh, new variants. So this is one aspect and that we are going, this is going into virology. This is not my area of expertise of why the virus mutate and what's going to happen for how long it will be keep mutating. That, that, that's uh, another uh, issue. But um, with, the, the, with, the vir- with, the, with this being the situation, with the virus mutating, with the efficiency of the vaccines will be uh, being short lived. So it's not that we are one vaccinated and that's it. We need to be revaccinated even for the same variant frequently. And so many people are, are not uh, vaccinated, uh, didn't receive their boosters. So all this contributes in addition to the change in condition during the year in terms of ventilation as being inside. Uh, more opportunities for infection. So it all contributes to this uh, this new waves of infections. We've, we've seen this with the, if you look at the previous pandemics, um, for example, the uh, Spanish flu, you also would saw that there were waves of uh, of infection. So this is, this all these factors keep changing and in contributing. So in that sense, that's similar. I have the feeling that with this pandemic we have we have more variants than in previously. But again, this we are um, entering the area of virology here, on which I would like to go too far into. But I guess also, what will the attitude of saying that this is just going to go on forever? What 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 are the implications for any improvement in ventilation standards, for air quality standards, for even monitoring? Um, I mean, we've seen there's this significant re- rejection and refusal to even implement mask mandates, which, as far as public health measures go, are, are very simple and, and essentially painless um, from the point of view of the population, from a logistical point of view. If governments are taking the attitude, and I realize state governments may vary, it's going to vary from region to region, but given that this is a global pandemic with a global impact, um, and in Australia, of course, it touches each region with equal ferocity. What is the implication for any improvement in standards, any improvement in, in indoor environments for, for ordinary people, certainly, um, if, the, if the attitude of government says the pandemic will just be around forever and we all have to deal with it? But if this is the attitude of the government, the, par- the pandemic will be forever, and that all the other respiratory infections will be forever, as they've been, we said forever and nothing has been done, where well, they will indeed be forever, be indeed causing lots of health impacts, economic losses, and all kinds of losses to the society, losses which could be uh, significantly, significantly reduced, and somehow the government doesn't see that. Well, we had the phenomena in Victoria when, about a month ago where this, the state health minister publicly admitted that she got advice from her medical officers to implement uh, mask mandates, but she was rejecting this because she listened to business rather than the medical advice. It was very blatant and out there and uh, and quite shocking to to many millions of people who heard that. 
but that's not up because it's becoming quite common those kind of admissions. That's right. Well, the the, the the situation with mask is somewhat different than the situation with ventilation because ventilation is not something which individuals could do something about. It is really the government should set up standard guidelines and the measures for implementation of this. And they prefer not to do this because of complexity and of all, all kinds of reasons. But with masks, this is um, mandating mask wearing. It's then putting the responsibility on individuals. And it, in, initially, when nothing was happening about the ventilation, but masks were mandating, which is a good thing that they were mandating, but still it was putting the responsibility on individuals. But individuals, after some period of time of wearing masks, were unhappy with this. Because this is not something as a society for the future. We shouldn't say, okay, let's don't worry about ventilation. Other things will be complete. We'll be wearing masks all the time and it'll be fine. It won't be fine because masks, it, it's not a long-term solution. And uh, one of the things I wanted to begin uh, asking you about, and that was your opinion about what has happened to Dr. David Berger. Well, my opinion about this is very clear, and it was expressed as the of the as of the team which submitted an open letter recently, uh, expressing our great dissatisfaction with what happened to uh, Dr. David Berger, and to the fact that uh, his uh, statements, which were very true about the um, um, the whole problem. Was, were treated the way they were. So um, I have a very clear view on this. When and were you surprised about the response of APRA to Dr. Berger? I was very surprised by this because after all, we are living in a country where free speech is basically taken for granted. And uh, seeing that free speech is not allowed, uh, this was a big surprise to me. Uh, David Berger is not the first doctor or, or academic, particularly during the COVID pandemic, who's come under attack, either from the sort of government or public institutions or, or so on. Um, I guess where he's, he's a man who's advocated zero COVID, the elimination of COVID within Australia, and, you know, has been accused in a sense, not of spreading misinformation, but of essentially engaging in, uh, you know, what they describe as impolite or disrespectful discourse. I guess if that were the principle applied broadly, generally, what would the implications be on health workers being able to communicate with the public? I've been interviewed well um, several times a week, and I see openly what I think what the government is doing or not doing, and sometimes using. Uh, quite uh, definite terms, like on one in one interview, I said that uh, the Queensland government doesn't know how to spell the word ventilation because they never talk about ventilation. So this wasn't polite, was it? Um, so, so therefore, uh, I don't know what what is that specific, what's not because once say you say, well, airborne transmission is a fact, the, the zero COVID policy is wrong. You should take haste this and this. So. What's impolite about this? Well, that's one of the difficulties with the opera process. The complaint is made anonymously and it's never properly disclosed publicly. So we don't know what the so-called incidences of impolite or unprofessional behaviour are. Thanks for your time. All right. Well, we'll keep fighting. <laughs>